Good morning. There are some things you simply do not want to end, <laughs> this being one of them. Thank you, Eric, for that magnificent prelude this morning. It took me way back many years ago, sitting with Nancy Jackson of this congregation in box back garden, listening to the sounds of that echoing from a recording inside the museum that is now his home. Thank you. Welcome this morning. Glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. Delighted to have Anne Corbett back with us. She's filling in once a month for us during these winter months, and we are delighted to have her back. No stranger to First St. Andrews, Anne, for those of you who are strangers, grew up in this congregation, so it's really welcome home. Do take note of all of the other notices on your insert. They are all important to the life and work and witness of this great congregation. As on previous days, while we welcome you through the atrium, those of you who are able and do not wish to use, or, or those of you who do wish to use the elevator, feel free to leave by this door. Those of you who are able bodies, we invite you to leave by the narthex doors and to simply walk around to the parking lot. It's uh, important that we all keep our distance and stay safe during this pandemic, which persists and uh, looks like it will be with us for a considerable while. October, of course, is Stewardship Month, and uh, during this Stewardship Month, we recognize the stewardship of the native peoples, the original peoples of this great land, which they call Turtle Island and which we call Canada. And so we are grateful for the stewardship of the Anishinaabe, the Atawandaran, the Huron, and the Wendat people. in all of Christendom, one that many people pray often. Light, light that greets each morning, light that dispels the darkness, light within the inner mind that enlightens, brightens, inspires light. They called him the light of the world. And we remember his teachings 
and we walk in his light as children of light. Come down, come down. Please join me in the call to worship and the opening prayer. Come down, O love divine. Come down, O love divine. Come down. O love divine, and dwell among us. Let us pray. Draw us, Holy One, into community with one another. Draw us, Holy One, into service to our neighbors. Draw us, Holy One, into the great heart who holds all our little hearts and make us each and all a blessing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
It's good to be with you this morning. Reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8. Soon afterwards, Jesus went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Cusa, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. The second reading is from the Gospel of John. They took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. Standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. For the word of God in scripture, among us and within us. Let us pray. O living word, I pray that in my words, your word be spoken. May I be a cup of water that satisfies the thirst a flame that illuminates and warms, a tree that shelters and protects. Amen. I know a woman, I'll call her Jessie. And Jessie, though long in the tooth, packs her suitcase twice a year and makes the tedious journey from London, Ontario to Kingston. She prefers to let her daughter do the driving. And when they arrive at the penitentiary, the two of them enjoy a lengthy visit with Jesse's son. This is a journey that Jesse has been making for over 20 years. She does it with faithfulness, with compassion and dedication. Her son's imprisonment is a great source of sadness. And yet she looks forward to her visits, setting aside his culpability and celebrating him for the intelligent and creative person that he is. She is a model for her children who bear the weight and the shame of their brother's lifelong incarceration. And Jesse, is a tower of strength. I know a woman, I shall call her Margaret. She is a gentle soul who dedicates her life to the art of listening. She is what one calls a spiritual director. She walks with women and with men as they travel the road of faith. Margaret has a tremendous and highly valued gift of enabling others to perceive the movement of God's Spirit, not only within their hearts, but within their interactions and within this bruised and broken world. Margaret has the unique ability to stoke the fire that burns in the heart of all who long to walk with God. At times she will challenge, at times she will question, but at all times she will practice the presence of love. And Margaret is a tower of strength. 
two weeks ago, I was fortunate to stumble across an online presentation on a particular woman who has been described as a tower of strength. The woman to whom I refer is Mary Magdalene. Dr. Teresita Cambites, scholar and teacher, argues persuasively that Mary Magdalene, far from being the rescued, fallen woman whom she has often been described to be, was in truth a tower of strength. It's quite possible that she was, in fact, a retired businesswoman who provided Jesus with resources he needed to carry out his ministry. I say could because there is no proof, and yet the evidence points to a strong possibility. In a moment, I will speak about Mary's active role in the ministry of Jesus. What I want to remind, remind you is this. The most detailed and profoundly moving account of the resurrection centers around Mary Magdalene. It's found in the Gospel of John. According to John, it was Mary Magdalene who had the first direct encounter with the risen Lord and was the first to share the Gospel. Christ gave Mary, a woman, the responsibility to share the news of the resurrection with the male disciples. She was the first evangelist. Perhaps this is why the Eastern Orthodox Church bravely and scandalously declares that Mary is not only equal to the apostles, she is apostle to the apostles. If we desire to discover more about the identity of Mary Magdalene, we must travel to her place of birth. In 1971, excavations began at a site in Lower Galilee, along the shores of the sea, and the ancient Jewish town of Magdala was unearthed. In 2009, archaeologists made the most important discovery in Israel in 50 years. They unearthed what they called the Magdala Stone, a piece of ceremonial furniture two feet wide, two feet long, and one foot high, on which the Torah and other holy scriptures would have been placed. Below the stone was yet another surprise, a first-century synagogue, the only one in Galilee. It's very likely that Jesus would have preached in that very building. Another point of interest is the discovery of three purification baths, which played an intrinsic role in the religious ritual. These baths were supplied with fresh spring water, the town of Magdala was wealthy. They had a complex hydraulic system. In other words, they were blessed with running water. But what is of particular interest to me is the infrastructure for the fishing industry, a tower. The Hebrew word for Magdala is migdal. Migdal means tower. The tower that was excavated would have been used for drying and salting fish. Magdala was not only a port, it was a destination, a center for fishermen and businessmen. And while it was a Jewish town, it was an integral point of commerce for the Roman Empire. We know Mary by the name Magdala. Women in the Gospels were typically described in relation to their husbands, but Mary is not described as a wife of anyone. Rather, she is associated with the town. For this reason, some academics are quite certain that Mary was a businesswoman, that her vocation, likely alongside her husband, would have been that of procuring fish businesswoman. 
This is a far cry from former prostitute, which is the way she was portrayed 1,400 years ago in a sermon by Pope Gregory. And the portrayal still sticks. Gregory studied the stories of two women in scripture, the woman named Mary Magdala and the unnamed woman in the Gospel of Luke, who is identified as a sinner, and who, in a beautiful, sensual act of devotion, anointed and kissed Jesus' feet. Now, in the eyes of Gregory, this unnamed woman was a prostitute, and he managed to merge this woman's identity with that of Mary Magdalene. Thanks to Gregory's mishandling of scripture for the last 1,400 years, Mary Magdalene has been portrayed as a former prostitute. God bless Pope Gregory for Gregorian chants, but not for his biblical scholarship. It's true that in the Gospel of Luke, we read that Mary was cured of seven demons demons likely representative of serious physical, mental, or spiritual illness. Mary must have been very ill. But by the time we meet her in the Gospels, Mary is healed. Luke also tells us that Joanna, the wife of Cusa, who was the manager of Herod's household, Susanna and many others traveled with Jesus and provided for him out of their resources. These women were women of means. Joanna's husband, Cusa, was Herod's minister of finance, if you will. He was powerful and wealthy. Mary, Joanna, and Susanna traveling with Jesus were the ones with the proverbial credit cards. They were the ones who enabled things to happen. It would seem that Mary, likely widowed, was in the position to help Jesus. A revolutionary concept. Mary of Magdala, quite literally, Mary of the Tower, a tower of strength. That she was a woman of beans is one thing. But what speaks to us even more profoundly is that she chose to witness firsthand the unspeakable agony of Jesus. She stood at the foot of the cross. Quoting John again, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. It is not only significant that these women chose to be present to Jesus' suffering, but that each of them was standing. Mary Magdalene, a tower of strength, standing. Not sitting, not kneeling, not collapsed, overwhelmed with emotion, as I most certainly would be, but standing. Standing in solidarity with Jesus, in solidarity with her friends. Mary Magdalene, tower of strength. I think of Jesse, the model of compassion, who twice a year packs her bags and makes that tedious journey to Kingston. She stands alongside her son, a convicted criminal, demonstrating that no one escapes the infinite embrace of God. In the spirit of Mary, Jesse extends her arms, enfolding and uplifting. It's not that she never weeps. In truth, she frequently does. Her own refuge is the palpable embrace of Jesus. Her strength is the risen, loving Lord. Thanks be to God.
Let us share together in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and Holy One, whose hands divine hold us so firmly that we cannot fall. Lift each one of us into your presence this day as we remember all your blessings. As we recall your coming among us in the person of Jesus, as we remember his teachings, his forgiveness, his healing presence, and his grace. As we look at the world around us and remember your creation, the wonder of the starry heavens, the wonder of a blue jay or a cardinal at the bird feeder, the changing of the seasons, the changing of the human season, the stages of our life, those who have gifted us and those who we have gifted. Gracious and Holy One, Whose wounded hands hold each wounded soul. We remember before you this day those who keep in contact in a variety of ways through those who are in prison. Those who are incarcerated in man-made cells. Those who are imprisoned within their own minds by fear, anxiety. Those who are imprisoned by violence, abuse, All those who are wounded within themselves through the loss of a loved one who walk in the valley of the shadow longing for green pastures and still waters. Eager to find that place of peace. Eager to find that place of release. Gracious and Holy One. Whose loving hands reach out to touch our hands, whose loving hands wipe away each tear we shed, whose presence comforts us, becomes for us a tower of strength. Walk with us this day. Walk with us the Jericho roads that we travel, 
The Galilean hills we climb. Walk with us. The roads of loneliness and depression. The values of forgetfulness and pain. Gracious and holy one, walk with us. Abide with us. Dwell with us. Come down, O love divine. And walk us into the brightness of a new tomorrow. Rolling aside all stones that crib, cavern, or confine. All this we ask in the simple words that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And leave us not in each temptation, but deliver us from evil. As on previous Sundays, we thank you for your offerings by car or your checks in the mail. For those of you who are visiting this morning and wish to read the token of your thanksgiving, there are plates placed in the narthex and in the atrium. And you can leave your offering there as you leave.
go forth and be a blessing, so that the world may be fortified by grace. The eye of God be dwelling with you, the foot of Christ in guidance 